Good afternoon and welcome to the Casa Italiana Hall. My name is Francesco Isgro and I am the president of the Casa Italiana Social Culture Center, a nonprofit or cultural organization founded five years ago. As you may know, October is Italian American Heritage Month when we celebrate the accomplishments of those with our shared Italian heritage. In a way, Every day is Italian American Heritage Day around here. Our mission is to celebrate Italian and Italian American contributions to America throughout the year. We do so through programs and projects that promote and preserve our heritage and legacy for our community here at Casa Italiana, but also in the greater Washington region. Over the course of our short organizational history, we have built a museum next door that showcases the contributions of Italians and Italian-Americans have made in our nation's capital. We are recording the whole histories of local Italian-Americans for our Marconi project. And this year, we have also established an Italian legacy research grant program in which this fall, we are engaging five local area college students in conducting research on topics that further the mission of our organization. We also celebrate our Italian American heritage throughout the year by publishing Voce Italiana, our Italian American community paper. Our newest initiative is this Italian Legacy Lecture Program. This is our second lecture in this program, which we hope will enrich the dialogue about our Italian American culture it also serve to strengthen our knowledge of Italy and our ties with our ancestral homeland. Earlier this year, we were honored to have as our inaugural speaker, Ambassador Luigi Einaudi, who spoke eloquently and thoughtfully about our Italian-American heritage today. It was an educational and inspirational introduction to the lecture program. Today, we are equally honored to have another distinguished guest, Professor Vito Tanzi. As a distinguished economist, among other professions, Professor Tanzi will analyze the unification of Italy from an economic perspective. His interpretation reconsiders some established notions. This topic is important not only to those of us whose ancestors migrated from Southern Italy but to all Italians. I would like now to introduce our chairman of the board of directors, uh, Ciro De Falco, who will provide us with some details about Professor Tanzi's uh, impressive uh, accomplishments. Ciro De Falco himself has also had a long and distinguished economic and diplomatic career in Washington and abroad. He was an economist with the Department of Treasury and then with Inter-American Development Bank, where he was appointed executive vice president and served until his retirement in 2008. This lecture program is Chiro's brainchild, and we are grateful for his initiative. Enjoy the program, and afterwards, please join us for an informal gathering in a glass of Prosecco. Chiro. Thank you very much, Francesco. Can you all hear me okay? As Francesco pointed out, we have this uh, lecture series called the Legacy Lecture Series, and he said that Tansi talked about Italian identity today. Uh, we decided to, since uh, Francesco said October is an Italian-American month, it's appropriate that we talk about a little bit about the story of Italy, and particularly the unification of Italy in 1861. Uh, the story of Italy is not well known in the United States, and I may dare say not well known in Italy as well, at least not the way that uh, our distinguished guest has analyzed it in his book. Uh, the book he has written is called Italica, with a subtitle, Uh, unità, unificazione italiana fra realtà e re, 
from ideal in real time. So it's the difference between what, what was the ideal of the unification and what really happened. So in his book, he talks about the experience with the, under the unification of Italy. And the book I read and reread is extremely well uh, done. And uh, at the end, I'll talk to you about, there's some copies in the back. If you, those of you who want to get a copy, I think for $20, you can get one. We just start a batch from Italy. Um, it, it will be available in the back at the end of this. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Vito Tanzi. He was born in Mola di Bari, which is outside the body. It's in southern Italy. I'm going to tell you when. I don't want to give away your age. You mind? <laughs> uh, he came to the U.S. I guess you were in the late teenagers, 20, in the 20s you came, huh? 20 yeah. years old. He received, he went, to, he went to George Washington University here in D.C. from where he got a, a B.A. and M.A. in economics. He then uh, went to Harvard University where he got a Ph.D. from the economics department. If I'm not mistaken, he was one of the first Italian immigrants to get one from the economics department. I think that uh, Luigi Einaudi, who gave the first lecture, also got a, a PhD, but he got it from the political science department. I think he Just probably about the same, same time. time, about the same time as you. After his uh, PhD work at Harvard, he uh, worked for the Joint Economic Committee in Congress, the OAS, he had many other activities. Uh, and finally, he started teaching at American University here in Washington, D.C., uh, where he taught economics and eventually uh, was made chairman of the, the Department of Economics. He then moved to the IMF, where he was, uh, was uh, head of the tax policy division. And in 1981, I can now give some dates, 81 is not so long ago, <laughs> He was promoted to be the chairman of the Fiscal Affairs Department. Uh, for those familiar with the IMF, they say that the, 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 the fund does a lot of, at least all of the, the, the economics work done by the, the IMF. For those of you who know the IMF, it's about how do you handle fiscal policy, government spending, monetary policy. So the joke is, that IMF doesn't mean International Monetary Fund. It means it's mostly financial. Fiscal. Or fiscal. Fiscal. <laughs> uh, after leaving the IMF, he served in the Italian government at the ministerial level as under Secretary of Finance. I guess that's, a, that's probably a unique experience. I don't think there was another immigrant who went back to Italy and, and served in the government in the position that he had, at least none that I know of. He has published a number of books on a variety of subjects, tax policy, the role of government in the economy, Italy's economic development, Argentina's economic development, Russia's transition from socialism to a market-oriented economy, among other things. From 1994, he served as president of the International Institute of Public Finance, of which he's now honorary chairman. He received many honorary degrees from a number of universities in Italy, Latin America, and in Europe. Uh, as you can see, he has a, had a very distinguished and varied career. So it is an honor for me now to introduce you, Professor Vito Latanzi, who Tansi will talk to us about the unification of Italy. Okay, Vito, it's all yours. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you very, very much. Uh, you know, first of all, I was, I want to thank uh, Casa Italiana, its and its president for the invitation, and especially Ciro De, Va De Falco, who was instrumental in convincing me to to prepare and to come and give this uh, lecture. You, you may ask uh, maybe one, one obvious 
initial question is why Casa Italiana would be interested in Italian unification when it deals with the Italian-American. And I want ju just to mention a connection that Italian unification had much to do with the immigration, especially from the south of Italy. And no, after 20 years after the unification, people from the south started living in millions, and most of them left Italy for Argentina, for the United States. In the United States, many of them went to New York, Chicago, uh, San Francisco, etc. Not too many in Washington. And uh, so that's the connection, maybe. If you need to have a justification of yes, why you invited yes, me, yes, yes. you can use that okay. as, a, as a justification. You know, this, uh, well, let me uh, also say a few words about how this book came about. You know, I'm obviously, I'm an economist and not a historian, and the book deals with historical uh, f facts, you know. So how did it come about? Well, many years before the 150th anniversary of the Italian unification, uh, I was contacted by a group in New York, of Italo American in New York, that they used to publish a, 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 a journal called IDEA, and uh, they asked me if I could contribute an article for an issue that they were preparing for the 150th anniversary. I was not uh, very happy with the request, but uh, some of the people who contacted me were from Mola di Bari, and so I find it a little bit difficult to say no. And uh, so I accepted unwillingly, and, uh, and I, with the idea that I was going to write a short article. And then I started reading the literature, and I have the advantage that I can read French English and Italian. And uh, so I started uh, reading many books. I, I am buying many books. I, I developed a very, very large collection of books on Italian unification. And, uh, and so the more I read, the more the story that I had learned in a school in Italy before I migrated to the United States became less and less convincing, you know? One thing that struck me from the very beginning was that the, the four great heroes of the unification of Italy, which were Garibaldi, Mazzini, Cavour, and Vittorio Emanuele, all, all four came from a small corner of Italy, the north uh, east, uh, northwest corner, which was most likely the least Italian of all parts of Italy. So this was something that puzzled me. You know, how come the true Italian were not involved in this? And uh, so anyway, as I, I read more and more, I became more and more obsessed with the, with the issue, with the questions. You know? And uh, in addition to buying many books, uh, by the way, for a year or, or more, I put aside anything else, and I totally, it was a total obsession on uh, uh, thinking and, and trying to, to see what I could answer. What, and how this, how the, the book essentially came about, you know, also to get a, a feel of what had happened. Me and my wife went to, to Naples, so we spent some time in Naples, to get a feel from the, the city. We went to Torino. I had a uni honorary degree from the University of Torino, so I knew people there. And we went there, we spent some time. I we even went in uh, London. We vi visited the, the Masonic uh, Museum. There is one in London because I, was, I became aware that the Masons had played a large role in the Italian unification. In fact, Garibaldi had been a, a well-known Mason. And uh, so th that's anyway, that's how the, the book uh, came about. You know. By the way, the people in New York did not like at all the small article that I wrote for them, you know. But the uh, historical journal in Italy found it very exciting because it was a new way of looking at some of the issues, and they published it. Anyway, eventually the book came about, 
and uh, and uh, it was published, and then it has been republished two two three years ago in a new edition, which is uh, with some uh, stylistic uh, correction. My Italian is is fluent, but it has been corrupted over over. 60 years of uh, speaking English and other languages, so it's no longer the, the, as good as it should be. So, so the new edition is much nicer, and uh, the, the lady who took care of, of it, who is a historian from, uh, from Fasano in Puglia, she did a very, very nice job, and I want to acknowledge uh, her work. Well, that's, uh, let me see the Italian... Peninsula before the unif unification, you know, I'm sure probably many of you already know some of these things, but let me, let me summarize some of the main issues. There was, uh, before unification in 1861, there was no Italy in, in a political sense or, or even in a cultural sense. There was a, an Italy in a geographic sense. There was an area in the peninsula uh, south of the Alps which was called uh, Italy. The name of Italy, interestingly enough, comes from Calabria, you know, that many, not too many people know that. You know, there was in Calabria, at the time of the Greek, there was a small tribe that called, was called Italoi, and those are the ones who, who passed the name uh, to Italy. Anyway, at that time, in, before the unification, there were seven states in Italy uh, totally independent one from the other. They had different languages, they had different laws, They've, they have even different ways and measures, and uh, different history. And, uh, and before that, you know, in, in Italy, for a long time, your worst enemy was the, the town nearby, you know. I cited in the book a saying from Tuscany, which says that it is better to have uh, a debt in the house than uh, somebody from Pisa at the door, you know? Was this to summarize the way many Italian thought of, uh, you know, your enemy, enemy was the name, was not somebody coming from France or, or Spain and so forth. Anyway, in, in, the, in the 15th century, Italy became a battle, battleground in the 16th century for foreign sources. The Spaniards tried to conquer Italy. The, the French tried to conquer part of Italy. There were fights uh, and the battles and so forth. But uh, in the, during that time, there was a slowly the view that maybe there were in, in, in this uh, peninsula, there was more than just uh, ge geographic place called the Italy. There was also a cultural or a historical place, you know, that, uh, and, uh, and you begin to have uh, some, some hints of that. Guicciardini, the famous historian, wrote a history of Italy that uh, went, did not attract much attention for a long time, but it was the, the first time that somebody looked at all Italy and the, the history of the whole region. Dante, of course, Petrarca and Boccaccio, they create a language that slowly became the, the language of culture, the Italian, which, mind you, were, were very few, you know, where one or two percent of the population spoke the language of Dante. The, la the rest of the population had to transform the Latin into, I don't know how many, 8,000 different dialect, you know, if every town had a different dialect, you know, if you go to my hometown, uh, Mola, and you go to a, to a town uh, six miles away, which is Rutigliano, or another town, Conversano, which is another six, seven miles away in the other direction, they all speak da different dialect. Of course, if you are from the same area, the dialect, you can still understand the others, but they are different languages, you know. And uh, how did this dialect came about? Well, this dialect came about because Italy did not have too many roads, and many areas in Italy were self-sufficient self at a very basic subsistence level. They could produce enough food to sustain themselves. So there were very, very few uh, trading exchanges uh, among Italians for a long time. And uh, so the, each one, each place developed its own dialect. And then uh, uh, until, uh, 
until again, until Dante and company developed this uh, Toscan dialect, which had became, became uh, eventually became the language of, uh, of Italy. Now, how does uh, the movement where the unification comes about? Well, there are different trends to, to that. One was that of these uh, seven states that exist in Italy, three were relatively important. One was the, the Kingdom of Naples and Sicily, you know, which was the largest. The second one was the Kingdom of Piedmont, which was smaller but important. And the third one was the papal uh, state, you know, the, the, the central Italy, which was uh, occupied by, was uh, controlled by the Pope and by a, 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 a government uh, led by the Pope. So the, this was the situation at the time. In, uh, in the, around 1840, I, I don't remember now the precise year, the, the kingdom of Piedmont, of, uh, which was Sardinia, the kingdom of Sardinia, uh, issued a new constitution, which was a constitution that gave, gave lots of civil liberty to people, liberty of press, liberty of, of uh, thinking, of uh, writing, and so forth. And so some uh, Italian intellectual from other regions started moving toward the Piemonte, where, to Torino, where they could uh, speak their mind and criticize their own government in Naples or in, uh, in, where, in other places and uh, without uh, concern. By the way, there was also part of Italy which was occupied by Austria, which was Veneto and Lombardy at that time. The Austrian were occupied this part. Well, the, uh, in that period, Cavour became the prime minister of the, of the kingdom, kingdom of, uh, of uh, Sardinia. And uh, Cavour was a very intelligent man very modern in many ways. But first of all, his name was not exactly Italian, you know. You, you, don't know, you don't know too many Italians called Cavour. Second, his mother was Swiss and she was a Protestant. Third, he was very anti-religious. You know. Fourth, he was totally enamored of uh, the French and the uh, English culture. You know, he had been uh, several times in, uh, in London and several times in Paris. He had never been south of, uh, of Firenze, Florence, you know. And he, he thought that going south was totally useless because they were all corrupt. That was uh, Africa, and so why bother to, to go? Now, this was uh, the view that uh, he, he had. So anyway, the Piedmont attracted, started attracting intellectual from the Kingdom of Naples and from other area. And uh, they started criticizing their own state, you know. And uh, also at the same time, the king, the, the, I should say something about uh, Naples and the Kingdom of, uh, of Naples, you know. Uh, Naples, for many centuries, for several centuries, four or five centuries, had been one of the three most important and most uh, populous cities in Europe, you know, the main competition was Paris and London. No, that, that was uh, uh, Naples. Naples was an overwhelming city. No, there were lots of visitors that came to Naples. They were totally fasc fascinated by this city that they consider the most beautiful city in the world, you know. And there were lots of reports. Goethe, for example, the famous French, po uh, the German poet, spent two years in Italy, spent a lot of time in Naples, and he was fascinated by it. Stendhal, a f famous French writer, when he went to Naples and he went to, to the San Carlo Theater, he thought that this was the, the greatest thing he had ever seen in his life, you know? And uh, so they were totally, and Naples was a, a center of art, Caravaggio, et, et cetera, was a center of music, the, the Scarlatti brothers were considered the greatest musician in the world at that time, 
you know, it was a, a center of opera, Rossini, etc., originated in Naples. They were uh, also in the avant-garde in many other things. They created the small, the first, very small, but the first railroad in Italy, which had, had an area just in the area of Naples. They had to put the first uh, uh, ship with the uh, with engine in the Mediterranean. They had had the first cruise in Istanbul and so forth. So this was a very interesting state, but at the same time, it was largely a medieval state, you know. When Frederick II, who had created that part of, had dominated that part of the Italy in the 12th century. He's the, the, the king of Monte. if you go to Italy, one of the heritage sites in Puglia is Castel del Monte. When, uh, when he was there, he created this feudal system where he assigned very large pieces of land to the nobles with the understanding that they could not sell the land. You know, they could not uh, sell it. So that, uh, and, uh, but it, during, in, within those lands, those nobles had a total jurisdiction and total control, even legal control. So this meant that uh, the king of Naples could not really impose taxes, was very difficult, and could not even build roads. When he wanted to build roads, the noble would oppose the building of the roads in their land and so forth. Anyway, this was Naples. In Naples, there had been different uh, kingdoms, different uh, kings, you know. For the last 150 years before the, the unification, the kings of Naples had been from the Bourbon family, which was a, one of the very important royal families in Europe. In Europe, there were three royal families that dominated all of Europe. And uh, according to the law of the time, they had taken over, uh, they, were, they were put in, uh, in Naples legally, I say, and uh, the, they had become totally Neapolitan. They were no longer under the control of the Bourbon in Spain, you know, and, uh, and uh, they had to assimilate the language, the dialect, you know, and... Uh, and, and so, so that's, uh, uh, but this was a state which had very li little taxes because they could not uh, impose taxes and very little public spending. So it was a very kind of medieval type of state, you know, without excessive problems. But then uh, in, uh, in the 1840, the, when there were all this movement for new constitution in Europe, the king of Naples at the time had promised a new constitution, but then at the last moment, he changed his mind. Being a, a Bourbon, he changed his mind. The Bourbons they could not conceive that the decision were not made by the king. And uh, so, so this was uh, the view of the time. And uh, there were movements against the, the king in Messina, and uh, the, the king had sent some uh, I tried to repress this movement using bombs. So from that moment on, he was referred as King Bomb, you know, and this became again a very bad reputation. Also, there were lots of fake news, you know. There was a, a minister from, from England who went to Rome, the to Naples, and then he went back and he invented things about it, that he had been in the jail, he had seen horrible things, which was totally untrue. And there was always the, the view that the British, that were very expansionist at the time, this was the, the time of Queen Victoria, uh, they were very interested in, in controlling the Mediterranean. And the obstacle to them was real, the Kingdom of Naples. So there were all this movement against the King of Naples. Some of, were, of them were justified, some of them were less justified. Anyway, this was the situation at the time that was evolving. Cavour, I should add, that uh, and Cavour and, uh, and uh, the kingdom of Sardinia were very expansionist. You know, they were, that was a, almost a military uh, kingdom, which sometimes was, was compared to Prussia, because the king of, uh, of Sardinia was, was always in military uniform 
uniform and, and so forth. So they were very interested in expanding. They could not expand the north because there were Alps and there was uh, Switzerland. They could not expand over because there was France was more very powerful. But they tried to expand uh, uh, east toward the area which was occupied by Austria, which was uh, Lombardy and uh, Veneto. They were very rich, potentially very rich area. So that was, and they started the, the, the law, the war of independence against those countries with some help from Napoleon, from the, the successor of Napoleon in, in France. Not the first Napoleon, but the, the, the successor. And uh, so this, uh, anyway, Cavour had absolutely no interest in the south of Italy and never showed much interest. So his idea of unifying Italy was unifying the northern part of, of Italy. But then what happened? Then an accident, a most a strange accident happened. And what was this accident? Was the expedition of the Miller of the thousand. All at once, Garibaldi, you know, with this uh, group that he had assembled, goes to Sicily, lands in Sicily. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But one, one point I want to make is that uh, you know, this was uh, 18, 1860, 1860, when communication were very, very difficult. All at once, Garibaldi finds himself in Genova, which was part of the kingdom of, of Sardinia, uh, with the thousands of people. By the way, they were not a thousand, were more than a thousand. And uh, these uh, people included the adventurers from from Hungary, included some uh, British military, including a colonel, included even some tourists from England, you know. All at once, uh, Garibaldi finds himself with uh, three ships ready to accommodate all these people and take them to, to Sicily. So one of the great mystery in history, who financed this? How did uh, Garibaldi, that was not a rich man, he didn't have all that many connections. He had to spend much of his life in South America fighting against the Spaniards. All at, all at once, finds himself with the three ships, thousands of people ready to follow. So clearly somebody had organized this. And this is, I have not been able, with all the books I've read, and I've read many, many books, I've not really been able to solve this mystery, to find a clear answer on how this was, as who, who financed it. Was the master clearly played a role, the British may have played a role, Cavour behind the scene must have played a role because they started in the kingdom of Sardinia. Anyway, when, when a Garibaldi arrived in Sicily, they landed in Sicily, he was, uh, he was met by an army of 20,000 soldiers under a general. Well, they were, on one hand you have 1,000, on the other hand you have 20,000. What do you think happened? Well, what happened, very simple, that the 20,000 surrender to the 1,000. <laughs> so again, a, another strange mystery, you know. So the assumption is that the general had been bought, by, and uh, in fact the general ended up being a general in the in the new uh, Italian government later on. No, no. So anyway, they, they met. They were uh, well. By the way, in the, among the mill in the boat, there was even the wife of a Crispy. Francesco Crispi was a Sicilian who was, would become the prime minister of, of Italy. So these are all these very interesting things. In, 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 uh, in uh, Sicily, Garibaldi had a very easy life. You know, there was really no opposition. Then they crossed the strait into Italy. When they crossed into Italy, they found some minor opposition. You know, As I mentioned before, the the kingdom of Naples had never had an enemies. They never fought a war. They didn't really have a, a true army. The, the, uh, the, 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 the king of Naples at that point, the, the, the king Bomba had died. And his son was 23 years old and had become the king. 
So the king of Naples was only 23, 24 years old. He was called the Franceschiello. Apparently, he was a very nice guy. Everybody liked him, you know? And, uh, and uh, so, anyway, the bottom line that Garibaldi didn't find much of an opposition in Italy. They went up all the way toward Naples. When he reached Naples, he entered Naples in train, not on a horse, you know. And uh, he was immediately welcomed by the chief of police who had been appointed not too, too long before by the king. By the way, the king had issued a new constitution during those months, much in line with that of, uh, of uh, Torino, of, uh, of the north. But the new constitution had had a counter, a, a bad effect for him because it had alienated all the nobles and all the church. And, uh, and the king had been forced to change many of the key posts, the head of police, etc., putting new people there that he did not know, and he did not know how, how loyal they were. So, so this is uh, really the situation. And if you are, think of it in terms of modern thinking, you know, you ask yourself, what was the legal right of Garibaldi to go attack a, a, an independent nation that had the diplomatic relations with everybody and never fought anybody. The, the mother, by the way, the mother of the king of Naples was a Savoy at that time, you know, even. So, so was, you know, was really, the Garibaldi, you, the only way you can explain it, unless you buy the patriotic uh, uh, story, you know, that was, this was a, a, an act of banditry, bandi, bandism. Banditry. Uh, so that, uh, anyway, that's, that's what happened after. So, so the, the king of Naples escaped. He didn't want to, to have the reputation of the father of becoming a, a, king, a king Bomba. And uh, they went on the, in, the, in the fortress of Gaeta with his young wife. They were under siege by the the Piemontese that uh, they bombed them, many, many soldiers died. And anyway, that's, uh, that's uh, by the way, one thing that I, I should have mentioned, that when Garibaldi got to Naples, he was welcomed as, as a guest. He was put in the royal palace, in the guest quarters of the royal palace. He immediately declared himself a dictator. You know, he announced that he was a dictator of Naples, he started issuing decrees, and some of these decrees really were interesting. You know, one was to give a pension to the wife of a soldier who had tried to kill the king of Naples. You know, another one was to create a Masonic temple in, in, uh, in very religious uh, Naples. By the way, the religious institution in the, in the kingdom of Naples owned at that time before the unification, 40% of all the land of the south of Italy. So they had become a kind of welfare state on, on a very primitive and probably corrupt way. But there was a welfare state. So, so that was the situation. Well, now, the, the, gov the Cavour got worried about having... Uh, Garibaldi in Naples, because Garibaldi had followed Mazzini's view that Mazzini had wanted Italy to be unified, but Republican, not he didn't want kings and so forth. And, uh, and so Cavour got worried about this. So he convinced the king of uh, Piedmont to go with the army toward the, toward the Camp in Campania, toward the Naples. And that's wh what happened. When the king arrived there, Garibaldi, instead of fighting the king, he said, obey this guy, I obey, and got out of the way. And so he, we, you passed a kingdom from, from one king to another. No, and that really what happened. Now, what happened after the unification? And then I will stop there, just make a few comments on this, well, the, the, there was a series, of course, of laws that were passed in, in, immediately. One, the first law was that uh, they introduced uh, uh, universal uh, conscription. All the young people of 18 and over, until I don't know, I remember what age, 
there to serve in the military service. And this was in the military service of the new kingdom, which was the enemy of the old one. So people from the kingdom of Naples, from one day to another, they found myself forced to, to fight in, a, in, a, in an army which was contrary to, to their own, you know. So the first thing, this was the first thing, many, a large proportion of young people never showed up, you know, and there was a problem of, uh, of recruiting and so forth. Sounds familiar. Yeah? So, it sounds familiar, what's happening in Russia today. Yeah, yeah, probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, the second uh, thing that happened was that, uh, you know, as they had done in, uh, in Piedmont in earlier years, they, they nationalized all the land of the church. All this 40% of the land of the church was uh, taken over by the government and immediately sold because the kingdom of, uh, of Piedmont had a great need for, for money. And I, I, I'll come back to this in, in a minute. So they were sold, and they were sold at uh, very low prices. So you I have, I have the experience of my hometown where a group of people had some money, they bought this land, and it be became what were called the Benestante. When I was a child, there was still a club in my town, which was called the Club of the Benestante, the club of the well-to-do. It was a club of people who never did anything. You know, they lived <laughs> on, on rents from the land that they had bought after the unification, you know? So this was the second thing that, but much, by the way, much of this land from the church had been actually used by very poor people, was land, was, was what the British called commons, you know, land of promiscuous usage, you know, that, uh, that many very poor people used to collect uh, wood, to go fishing there, to, uh, to grow some little crops, you know. And all at once, these people lost control of, of this land. So, so this was the second thing. The thing was that uh, the, the taxes on land, which had been used in, uh, in uh, Piedmont by Cavour and so forth, which were very high compared to those in the Kingdom of, of Naples, were, were imposed to the south of Italy. So all at once, people owned land found themselves with much higher taxes. And see, this were, another thing that they did was to remove uh, the tax, uh, the import duties which had been used in the kingdom of Naples to protect some industry. There was some, the beginning of some industries with, which was protected by this import duty. If you put import duty, it's easier for you to produce something lo locally. They remove all this and they brought at the level that had existed in Piedmont. So this uh, created a lot of problem for the industry of the South. I mean, whatever industrial development there had been, pretty soon disappeared. What was the, the consequence of the, this? The consequence that many people became quote unquote bandits, no? And, uh, and uh, brigandage, uh, what is, is the word brigandage? In brigandage. <laughs> yeah, brigandage became a major problem. Yeah. And this has always been sold as people that became criminal from one day to another. But when people who become criminal from one day to another are not one or two or ten, but they are in the tens of thousands or even in the hundreds of thousands, then you, you ask yourself, are these really criminal or there are people fighting a civil war? So my interpretation, again, is my interpretation. I might be wrong, I'm sure. Pro pro probably if the professor Einaudi were here, the yeah. ambassador Einaudi was here, he would object to that. Yeah. <laughs> the, my, my interpretation that this was a civil war, and it was a horrible civil war. If you read the story, some of the report that the, the generals from, which were, lo were all the Piemontese, you know, uh, would send back to the headquarters saying that we had killed 3,000 people, we had shot so many priests, you know, we had cut the heads of so many people, we have destroyed villages because we found out that in this village there were some relatives of some, some who were bandits, you know. And so all the, the, the constitutional controls 
disappeared, you know. And this was a really a horrible, horrible war. That in the end, there are no the official estimates were never revealed. You know, apparently there are secret document which were never made public. But the best estimates that at least 100,000 people died in this. So we are talking about a large, large number of people. And this, of course, had a tremendous impact on the, on the south of Italy and uh, on uh, development. One last thing I want to mention, and then I will stop, that uh, in, uh, in the north, during uh, Cavour time in the north, Cavour, as I said, was a very modern person in many ways. And so he started spending more and more money when he became prime minister on the railroads and on other infrastructure in, in Piemonte and in, in Liguria, which were part of the, his, uh, his kingdom. And uh, this money came from two sources, one from the higher taxes that I've already mentioned. The other one came uh, largely from borrowing in London, from the Rothschild and from people like this, you know. So there was a large, a large amount of them. He used accounting tricks. He, was, he used what today is called the golden rule. The golden rule in the budgeting is when you remove all the expenditure that you call investment. If any, it's an expenditure, it's investment. You remove it and you, you, you declare the budget only on the basis of current expenditure and, and revenue. So the, the accounts were always in balance, but the debt was growing all the time, and it had become unsustainable. That before the unification, uh, Cavour was quoted that we have two choices. Now, one is bankruptcy, the other one is unification. How would unification help? Well, unification would help because the, the, the debt of Piedmont would be unloaded on the Italian government overnight, Piedmont no longer had debts. The Italian government, which was just born, was born with the, this huge debt. So this, uh, again, was a, a final thing that I want to mention, was that uh, not only the, the debt was un down low to Italian government, but the seven states that had existed be before, you know, some of them had a lot of gold, you know, especially the, the kingdom of Naples because it was very conservative at the time. The, the wealth of country was measuring gold, had a lot of gold. And uh, so this gold was immediately appropriate by the, the, the Piemontese and, uh, and you, by the new government of Italy and it became the, the gold of Italy, you know. So all this, when you put all this together, you see what, uh, what happened. What happened, and to conclude, is that up to the time of unification, much of the uh, migration, and there are a lot of statistics on this in the book, you will find, uh, came from the, the north of Italy. If you go to Buenos Aires and you speak Spanish, you know that the Spanish that they speak in Buenos Aires has the accent of Genoa, because many of the people had gone from Genoa to Bu Buenos Aires and so, so forth. So that most of the migration from the south was very small, very limited. 10, 20 years later after unification, the, the migration from the south became a tidal wave, you know, and, and the migration from the north became much less. So the whole, uh, and also look at the statistics of what happened to population in cities. You see that the, the city of Naples was the city that experienced the least growth in population after that, compared to Rome, Torino, Milan, eh, etc. So clearly, the unification of Italy, not intentionally, probably mistakes were made, maybe were an honest mistake, maybe people did not realize that they were making mistakes, and uh, when they equated the taxes in the north and the south, probably they thought that they were bringing equity, you know, why should the people in the north pay more tax than those in the south? So probably honest mistakes were made, but whether we're honest or not so honest, the, the problem for the south, you know, remained. The south was born, the Italy was born with a huge public debt and has continued to live with a huge public debt. 
Well, that's about all I want to say. Thank you very much for listening, and uh, I hope I've not shocked you too much, you know. <laughs> and uh, I hope, by the way, that, that we still are very proud of being Italian and living in a unified Italy, you know. I had, you know, I, we have no, no problem on, on unified Italy. By the way, one thing I should have said, which I, mean, I failed to mention, that over the year there had been many t proposals to make, to not co create a unified country, but you have a, either a confederation or a federation like the US, where the states are pretty much independent, but then there is a centralized government that coordinates some function. Maybe that would have worked better, at, at least at the beginning, and slowly we could have gone to a unified Italy. But uh, unification too quickly probably was not the right medicine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vito. That's a, that's a lecture on Italian unification history, huh? Mm. Uh, a couple of points. Uh, the mystery you talked about, how did uh, this all happen, was clearly Italy in 1860 had to come to some unification because the world was changing, mm. right? It would have been very difficult for Italy to continue to be a conglomeration of seven different city-states. Um, if they continued that policy, they will be, they will continue to be controlled by Austria, by the French, uh, uh, by uh, all the other big powers, because the history was that, as you pointed out, France, Austria had a lot to say about what happened in, 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 in Italy, and all these other countries were bigger, the world was changing, and so somebody had to take the initiative to bring them all together. The kingdom of Piedmont had this fellow Cavour, who was both a good strategist and a good diplomat. He perhaps saw something that the others hadn't seen because he was much more attuned to what's happening in the world. And so he worked very hard Rightly or wrongly, he managed to, whether he, he was, he probably had something to do with the Tamila for sure. Uh, he, he managed to bring the country together, or you know, the, the units together to make a, a unified country under the kingdom of Piedmont. Uh, the point is that all the problems happened after unity, right? Everything start falling apart. The South start falling behind. They were ahead. The political situation from the 1860 to the into the uh, 1900s, mm. the this political situation was very unstable, right? And the leadership. There was no leadership after the sudden death of Cavour. Cavour didn't live very long after unification. Yeah. So even if he had a lot to do with guiding the process, which he probably did, there was nobody to replace him to guide the process afterwards. So what happened between 1860 and 1920 was political upheaval in Italy. In fact, it was so bad that in 1920, was it 9, 28, the kingdom was given up on getting all the prime minister until this young fellow came in, I wasn't so young, said, I, only I can solve your problem. And his name was Benito Mussolini. So there are some historians that really divide modern Italy into three sections. First is the constitutional monarchy, Mm. Then this fascistic period. And then finally in 46, there is the Republic, right? With the, with the referendum after the Second World War. All the problems you pointed out, all the, 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 the immigration to the United States and to other parts, 
from the south, but you correctly pointed out, your numbers in the, in the book are very clear. The immigration from the north was considerably more than the immigration from the south. Maybe, maybe those in Naples were very happy it was all of me, you know, and they were very nice. Why go anywhere else? The king was taking care of us. It was only after things really got bad that they had to, they start taking off. So the first point I want to make is, would the history of Italy have been different? And this is a kind of a what if question. If, if Cavour lived another, let's say he was 52 or so when he died, he was very young. If he lived another 10 years and he, with his, with his ability to maneuver, to strategize, could steer the ship of state and prevent what happened in the 1920s. That's one, one point. The second point I want to make is the last point you made. You know, we're all Italians. We're, I'm sure we're all very happy to be Italians and we're very proud of that. But when the unification of Italy took place, uh, the, uh, Matteo D'Azeglio, was he, I think he's related to Ciampi, wasn't he? He yeah, must have been. He, he because was, Ciampi was yeah, Carlo D'Azeglio. He had Ciampi. lived in Rome, but yeah. he was Piemontese. He was Piemontese. He said, what, he said, okay, now we made Italy, we have to now make the Italians. Mm. Yeah, he was just aware like, of the difference that the yes, Cavour was exactly, not, yeah. exactly, exactly. Make the Italians. My point is, it's now been a hundred and, what, 60 some odd years that we had a unified Italy. The question is, do we now have, have we not we created the Italian? I don't mean the, the Italian with a birth certificate. I mean, do we have a... Do the Italians of the North and the South really share this, this, this consciousness of being Italian? Do we have the same, same view of what it means to be Italian? Why do I say that? I say that because even today with the new government, there are some people who we all know who they are. They happen to come from the North, who believe they should be greater autonomy in other words, they want to go back where you're talking about. They want to go back to the Federation. They want to, now they call autonomia differenziata. So at least as far as some sections of Italy, geographic sections of Italy, still are not convinced that what happened in 1960s really should still exist, that maybe we should go back to the future a little bit. So anyway, those are my comments. Yeah, those are, uh, you know, difficult questions to, to deal with. You know, the first thing was the, this prejudice against the South, you know. This, uh, you know, this is a beautiful, very interesting uh, book by Goethe, you know, the f most famous uh, German poet. Uh, it's called Italian Journey, you know. It's a long book about 500 pages. Yes. He spent two years in, uh, in Italy, and uh, like all the visitors, he was absolutely fascinated by Naples, which was, he thought was great, you know. He refers to his father, who had been uh, fascinated by, by Naples, and he said, no, he agreed completely. But he, he made also an observation that when he had gone to Naples, he had been told that the Napolitan, nobody works in Naples, they're all lazy. And he said, out of curiosity, being a scientist, he was very interested in science also, he set out to see whether that was true. And he tried to inspect all the people he had come in contact with. And the conclusion was that they were all very, very busy part of the day. But when they finished their work, they were all outside enjoying the, the weather and enjoying the good life. You know, Naples had the reputation of being the cheeriest, happiest city in the world also at the time. So this uh, is part of the prejudice. You know, Montesquieu, the famous French uh, po uh, not poet, uh, philosopher, that in 16th century wrote L'Esprit des Lois, the, the Spirit of Law, you know, he had written that people from the south were lazy because the weather is very good. They don't have to do very much to live. 
while the people from the north, they have to live in this cold weather. And so you develop different traits. And you see how this idea perpetuates in time. You have eugenics law in the US that they are carried on. And in the extreme version, you go to Germany and you have a, you have a Nazi law. And so, so but, but these things enter in the psychic of people and it's very difficult to, to change them. Now, the Cavour, if he had lived longer, I don't know whether he would have got rid of those prejudices. As I said, he had never been to the south of Florence. He had absolutely no interest. He thought that the British and the French were superior and, and so forth. Would he have changed? And by the way, all these expenses that he had made in the north with, uh, with borrowed money, they had prepared the ground for industrial development of the north. So, so the debt had been downloaded to the south and to the rest of it, not just to the south, but to all of Italy. But the, the real, the physical benefits from those expenses had stayed with the Piedmont. They had the, the, by far most of the railroad and, and so. So this facilitated the coming of fiat and so forth, which would create another problem after the Second World War. After the Second World War, you know, and I wrote one time, one of the earliest articles in economics that I wrote almost 60 years ago in, it, in an Italian journal too, which was that at that time, lots of savings from the South, you know, people would save, put the money in the bank, but the saving would go to the North and be invested in the North. At the same time, the young people who would live with their parents in the South, the parents would spend a lot of money to, grow, to, to raise them. By the time they got to 17, 18, they moved to the North and they contributed to the development of the North. So there were all this vicious cycle that was very difficult. To, to change, but maybe one last comment related to what you said. Germany had, you know, Germany would be unified also about 10 years after Italy, but Germany had chosen a different path, which was the federal path. You know, they, they had not tried to make everybody subject to the, exactly the same law and the same rules and the same thing, you know. There is in the book, there is the story of this uh, famous uh, person from the, the, the Risorgimento, you know, that had, uh, was from Bologna, had gone to London because uh, he had been threatened of, uh, his life had been threatened by, by the state where he lived. And he was all for Italian unification. He had become the, 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 the one who cared the British uh, library, you know was a very educated. After the unification, he was so happy with unification that he took a six years license and he went to Naples to, to see, to enjoy the unification. And he was totally shocked what the, the new government was doing with all these stupid rules. By the way, the rules came from, from France. I don't know, by the way, if you want to know what, how this rule came about, there is a program on TV called Versailles a series of, of episodes, which is very interesting to see how the Louis XIV introduced all these rules in France, to the extent that in France, you, the government decided what size and which shape the handkerchiefs should have. You could not sell handkerchiefs which were different in size or shape. You, if, if you were a beggar and you would would beg, you would need to go to the municipality, get a license, and the license told you exactly the corner of the street where you could beg. This, uh, these were the rules that entered the, the Piedmont, you know, and this was the rule that entered Naples. And imagine what rules like this would do to the Neapolitans, you know. So. One, one final point of historical interest. Uh, Italy's Unity came in 1860. The U.S. Constitution was approved in 1787. So some of the people in the Risorgimento, I guess, knew what happened in the United States when they abandoned the Articles of Confederation and went for the, the central government, much more, much more closer to a republic. It was not the confederation that 
that in the traditional sense, it gave more power to the central government, we still have a federal system, that maybe that also had an influence on the final decision, although I think there were other reasons. I think that really Piemonte wanted to take, wanted to get to the riches of Naples and, and run the show because they didn't think that the Southerners were able to do it, but that may be too far to go. Yeah, yeah. But uh, maybe uh, I'll leave it open, and if there are other questions, comments, anybody, please feel free. Yes. Hi, well, Professor, thank you so much. I learned, I learned, I learned Yes, speak, please, please. Come on, speak, Donna, please. Speak clearly, because I, yeah, I have some yes, hearing problems. Yeah, go ahead, stay there. It seems like almost a miracle that there is an and really today, considering what uh, the, the young government and young country had to overcome. Uh, but I was curious about the living conditions of the people in the South specifically that triggered this great migration that began in 1880. Besides just conscription and taxation, what were their lives like that drove them to leave everything for the unknown? Yeah, yeah two, two comments on that. You know, the first is that, uh, as I said, until the unification, migration from the South was very limited. So clearly the conditions were not terrible or were terrible by those the standards of that time. Of course, today we would find them very, very poor. No, but... Uh, and, but the, clearly the condition worsened after the unification. 10, 20 years later, because of the civil war that I mentioned, because of the taxes, because of the expropriation of, of the land, because of all this problem, which clobbered the South more than the North, so that the people were much, much worse off in that period. One element which is still very interesting, which is mentioned in the book, and I think the there are even statistics in the book that uh, those, the Italian who mig migrated from the north, they never went back to That's Italy. Those who migrate from the south, a very large proportion, about half of them, you know, made some money and went back to Italy. So from the cultural point of view, I think the south was still much nicer, you know. That, that the, well, this may have had something to do with it. people in the south live the mostly in towns, you know, and the town gives you a, a kind of community life, uh, celebration and so forth. Those in the north lived in isolated place in the countryside, you know, and uh, so maybe that, that might explain, but that, that's just an interesting element. But uh, again, the migration from the south really on a large scale started about 10, 20 years after the unification. Yeah. The 1900s, actually. Your numbers show that mm -hmm. the, in 1900 really took off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody yeah, else? Could you, can, yeah, the back there. Oh, yeah. The, the one back there, where he for us. Would you come up? Yes. So we can hear you. Come, come, come over here. We don't have microphones to give you. So if you stand right there, we can hear you on the, the audience. Yes. Yes, yes. It's just wanted, uh, your views on the role played by Sicily. Can you speak closer to the phone, please? There. Yeah. Can you hear? Yeah. yeah. No, it's not a phone. It's a camera. Stay there, though. Go okay. ahead. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. So it's like in the airport when you have to. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, the, the role played by Sicily in, uh, in, in the unification, in a sense, when, uh, when Pisacani tried the same, more or less the same expedition as Garibaldi did a few years before, but he went uh, to, to the continental south. They were, uh, uh, they found very strong resistance by the local population. They were uh, either uh, killed by the local population or arrested by the, uh, by the army. When uh, Garibaldi tried it, he found a lot of support uh, by Sicilian independentists who hoped to get away from Naples, because Sicily had never uh, accepted the domination of uh, the unification with the Kingdom of Naples and the nomination of Naples. Uh, there had been a, a, a series of, uh, of insurrections in Sicily before Garibaldi came. And uh, Francesco Crispi, who participated in the expedition of Garibaldi, is considered by some historians as the real uh, organizer behind the expedition. So I would, I would like to hear your views on this. Another uh, I, issue that may have played a role is the so-called Società Nazionale, the 
National Society, which was largely organized and financed and supported by the uh, Sardinian government led by Cavour in, in all parts of Italy, including in the south. How much of that did how much did it contribute to the to this to the uh, uh, eventual unification? Of, uh, the, the second question was the, the Società Nazionale, this uh, um, semi-secret organization supported by Nazionale. the Italian government in, in the various parts of Italy and financed by the uh, by Cavour and by the by the Sardinian government. The first question was Pisagani. You, you, your book doesn't talk about Pisagani. Pisagani was one of the. I guess before Caribaldi, he tried to also to fight yeah. for unification, but he went he went to the mainland. He didn't go to Sicily. No, but, but he, my question was uh, how much did uh, the Sicilian independentist uh, forces contribute to the success of Garibaldi? Yeah, this, 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 uh, you know, Sicilians I did not like uh, to be under Naples, so they hope to get away from Naples by yeah, uh, by the expedition. I did not have uh, time to mention, but one of the very important element was that, uh, you know, Sicily had been part of the kingdom of Sicily and, uh, before 1815, you know? Uh, in, in, uh, when Italy was occupied by the, the French, by the Napoleonic forces, then the French was defeated. You know, Joaquin Murat was shot in, in Calabria and uh, and they, they left, you know, and uh, Sicily at that time was given to Naples. So instead of having two states, the kingdom of Sicily and the kingdom of Naples, now you had one state with headquartered the, the court in Naples. There were 2,000 barons in Sicily that were very upset because they had lost their position in the court, and they hated the Napolitans. So this played in the hands of Garibaldi, and that's why Garibaldi landed in Sicily rather than go directly to Naples or to other parts of the south of Italy, you know? And, uh, but this made it very easier for, for, uh, for Garibaldi, and, uh, and that was a very, very important element of what happened, you know? I don't know whether I answered the question. No, that's, uh, yeah, I think that's... Is that is that a yeah. okay? Yes, can you please speak? Um, just wanted to make a comment to your question. My grandfather, one of my grandfathers, was one of those people who came in the 1800s, late 1800s, to the United States. And part of the reason was things were so bad there, given what you just mentioned, uh, taxes. But Another thing is, in the United States, it was an industrial era at that time. And in Sicily, it was primarily farmers. They went to the United States because, the, according to all the myths, everything was gold in the United States, and they could make a lot of money. And so they went to the United States to make money for their families back in Consistently, like many of the Hispanics today, come here hoping to make money and bring it, send it back to their people. Same thing at that during that period. And then my grandfather came back to the uh, to Italy, as he said. Many of them from the south came back. They love their families. Uh, their their hearts are in the country, um, but they were basically farmers. They didn't like industry. They didn't like working in, in, the, in the factories of the United States at that time because conditions in the factories were pretty bad in those days. So they came back and forth, back and forth. They needed the money. That's just a comment. By the way, if I could add uh, one comment, <coughs> that uh, the conditions in the north of Italy were really bad, you know, before 1840 or so. You know, there's a, a, a close friend of ours. He's a former uh, minister of finance and a former minister of foreign affairs and former presidential candidate in Argentina, Domingo Cavallo. And his family worked from Piedmont, you know. And one time he visited the area where the family had come from. And he was shocked by how poor 
these people were, no? So that, uh, in fact, their, their statement by Toynbee, the famous historian, about the kind of government that existed in Piedmont. And if you go to Piedmont, when, when we, we visited there, we were really shocked to see the, the, the Venaria, the royal palace, which was the largest palace in Europe, and to, to see the hunting lodges of the king. Of, and this was a very small country. So to build this enormous project for the king, give you some idea of the kind of country that exists until the constitution came. Then when the constitution came, things started changing and became a more modern state. But until that time, was not more modern than Naples, was probably much worse. No? You know, even in today, South is still primarily farming. And even today, uh, my, uh, several of my relatives go to the north uh, to, to work in the factories up there. Mm -hmm. Just because there's just more work and money up there than there is in the farming areas. So it hasn't changed all that much yet. It's a question of culture. Any other? Yes? Any other questions, comments? I was going to say, uh, immigration is right in some way. You know, the immigration that uh, uh, the immigration that come to this country in the twenties, you know, not 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 so much because uh, because the the, the Piedmontes put the south and then because there was a, a, a you know this uh, uh, revolution. And people from all over Europe who were coming in this country, in other countries, in South America, etc. It was not so much because of the Piedmontese putting the south in certain conditions. No, this, that condition that the side, the, the culture that is in the south, it has to do a lot with the, uh, with the 400 years of, of the Bourbons ruling the, the south of Italy. That, that caused this, this culture that we are in the south, you know. And uh, it's uh, not so much because of the Piedmontese that, that came to, uh, in the south and uh, ruled the country in the wrong way. Now, the, 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 the unification of Italy was a difficult thing to do because there were different factors. There was the public and kingship. But the, the fact that the king about the, 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 the reunification of the country, there was a great thing because at the fall of the Roman Empire, Italy it was invaded by all the other uh, you know, people. And uh, you know, to put, even today, we have so many parties in our, in our countries. You see, we, so it's not so much, we have to look at this reunification of Italy as a good thing. And, you know, it was difficult, but thank good that it came uh, to, to be what we are. Vito can defend himself better than I can defend him. But the point is, not that the, uh, the unification was a bad thing. The unification was a good thing. What he's arguing is the way it was brought about that the South was doing much better before unification than they did afterwards. So we, we, we agree. I mean, I'm sure the Southerners didn't want to leave, but the situation worsened, and they had an opportunity to come to the States or go to Argentina or Brazil. Uh, any other comments? Yeah, I, I, can I sure, add sure. A, another comment, which is mo much more speculative, and I feel not as 100% as, uh, convinced by it, but I think there's a lot of point. The fact that uh, Italy was not only unified, but was unified in a very centralized way, with all, all rules and regulation and all that, as I said, you know, a regulation borrowed, copied from France. This creates a view in the south of Italy that uh, the government is responsible for everything. You know, we, you know, you have the saying in Italy, piove governo ladro. You know, you blame the government for everything. You know, so if you don't succeed, is the government the fault? Because in I, I, when we go to. To my town, you know, I know well the mayor and I talk to, and we, we are shocked by the, the rules 
that still exists. You know, that you cannot sell a property because the municipal council has to, de has to decide what this property can be used for. There are still all these minor, idiotic, or often rules which have, have prevented the development. Because what did the, what happened in Italy? The, the irony that as time passed, you know, after the unification, the administration that was at the beginning mainly in the hands of people from Piedmont, slowly be transformed to the south. Now all the administration in Italy, there are people from the south, but they, they inherited this view that the government decides on everything, you know. Yes, and and that's, that, I think, has created a real problem. I just, today I, I received a, 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 a summary of a new book by two Italians that make exactly this point that the Italy has been, by the way, has been doing very, very badly in the past 30, 40 years. You know, I wrote a, a book some about 10 years ago called From the Italian Miracle to 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 uh, Il declino. To declino to <laughs> from Italian uh, miracle to stagnation, you know, and uh, pointing out that the first 30 years after the war were years of great growth. You know, Italy grew at about 6% per year, became one of the G7 countries, become a relatively rich country. The, the per capita income of Ita Italy reached about 80% of that of the U.S. After the 75, things go, go, start going downhill. Now we, we must be at 50% instead of, of 90%. There's been almost no growth for many, many years. And, uh, and that has to do with all these rules and regulation. This, uh, this every, everything is personalized. You know, family are more important than laws. And, uh, yeah. Well, there's a lot to talk about because what's also happening in Italy is a big brain drain. There's a different, there's a, there's a different kind of immigration, but we don't want to get into that. I'm told we have to end now. So I want to thank you very much, Vito. Let's give him a nice round of applause. Listen, I want you to know, I want you to know, I want you to know, he may be old, but his mind is like a photographic memory. He presented that paper. Don't, don't remind wrote, my wife that I'm old. No, 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 I said you may look old, but his mind, he, he did not skip a line, that 10 piece of paper that he had in front of him. So, Vito, thank you very much. You can still, you're still going full blast. Keep going. I'm looking for the next book. Okay, now, as I said earlier, there's a book in the back. Unfortunately, it's in Italian. For those of you who may be interested, you could buy one. He, I'm sure Bruno Abuido will be happy to sign it for you. Mm. Okay? Yeah, you might mention that this uh, is uh, available. Yeah, it's in the back. Oh, yeah. The, it's in the back. Oh, the this, this, uh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The the Italica. Italica. No, no, not the book, but the... the oh, book. yeah, oh, yeah. I'm going to say that now. The uh, He has some copies of his notes, the one he presented, and the other is we're going to put it on our website. You can go www casaitaliano.org is it Francesco casaitalianocenter.org and you will find his presentation and now in the back we have some prosecco and some cookies so we can celebrate have a drink on our special guest here today I'm, I'm, I'm Vito thank you very much thank you.